you. All right, hello everybody and welcome back. My name is AJ Edwards and this is my channel, Mr. E's Classroom. Today I am joined with a very good friend of mine and a wonderful colleague, uh, Mrs. Lindred. So good morning, Mrs. Lindred. How are you today? Morning, I'm doing well, doing well. All right, well, just like I always start off, what are you reading? Uh, well, um, I have picked up um, A Discovery of Witches. Um, I am only a few chapters into this. Um, it's very intriguing, but um, my sister um, told me I should start reading that. Um, but as most teachers, I'm reading, you know, teacher books and um, books for my craft as well and for my continuing education. So um, a book that I'm really interested in right now um, is, and I'm reading it um, through my class, is um, Deeper Learning. And um, that is from um, Dr. Martina. And um, I really like what she's doing there. She talks about a deeper learning, um, attacking the educational system from different areas, including like um, the technology tools and the education um, from the community and um, reaching out into society and things like that. So. Right on. Yeah, no, I'm actually uh, doing some personal professional development myself. I'm reading uh, Chris Tavani's Do I Really Have to Teach Reading? Uh, shout out to Chris Tavani. It's a really good text about uh, uh, literacy across the curriculum. <clears throat> and then also for my work, uh, we have a book club and we're reading uh, The Ventriloquist by E.R. Ramsapur. It's a really cool uh, World War II fiction text that uh, kind of helps make fun of Nazis. So I think it's a pretty good one. So it's a little bit of a longer read though. We, uh, we picked the book not knowing how many pages there are and we have to be through half of the book by April 1st. So 235 pages just to get us started. So I think a few of us are uh, buckling down. We're about to start spring break. So, so reading's about to happen. <clears throat> So today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our topic is talking about the phenomena that we have in education, where <clears throat> the average teaching career is around three to five years. And so what Mrs. Lindred and I want to talk about today is kind of identifying why this is happening. And uh, eventually, we'll probably make this into a two-parter, but uh, going into like, why is this happening, but also... Uh, some advice that we have for some future teachers. So um, again, for anyone that's new to this channel, uh, my name is Mr. Edwards. I'm a high school English teacher. I'm also licensed to teach uh, history. And uh, I'm also really into literacy and reading and uh, helping to put books in the hands of our children. Uh, so Mrs. Lindrick, would you like to uh, share some of your background with us? Sure. Um... My name is Mrs. Lindrick, and um, I have been um, teaching for 17 years. Um, graduated college in 1999 and went to um, my first teaching job right out of the gate. Um, I've been in various um, high schools. Um, I've actually taught a couple of years at middle school, um, which I found out was not my jam. And uh, I've actually left the profession um, three different times um, for personal and professional reasons, um, but really because I, I really thought there would be a better way for me to make a living and not be so stressed out and anxious all of the time. But my love of providing literature and writing skills to students abounds and I just keep coming back. So this is where I'm at for good now, I know. Yeah, and I think one of the things that, uh, that really stands out to me is, you know, so you've left the profession three times, but you said you've came back and, and that one word that always comes to mind when you say it is you came back for kids. And <clears throat> one thing that I, I get a lot of from friends, from family who don't really understand uh, why I, I do what I do is they're saying, well, how do you deal with the kids? How do you deal with the parents? And, and one thing I've noticed is that it's, it's never really the, the kids or the parents are rarely, shall I say, the cause for somebody's decision to leave the profession. And the kids are 99.9% .9 of the time the reasons for why a lot of us stay through the ups and the downs that come with this, with this, with this career. 
And uh, so that's, I think, one thing that I really wanted to dispel today is the idea that like kids are what drives us out of, of teaching or that parents are what drives us out of teaching. Um, so kind of, uh, I'm gonna expose my secret. I've only been teaching, I'm finishing my fifth year right now. So I'm not uh, gonna pretend to be, I know, I'm, I'm not gonna pretend to be, you know, Joe Schmo, the expert, but kind of like what you had said, Ms. Linda Dom, I really can't see myself anywhere else. Um, besides the Marine Corps, uh, teaching is like the only job where I'm excited to go to work every day. And even in, in the rough days, you know, the times, you know, I've been in a district that had a huge financial crisis where they were giving out pink slips left and right because they just couldn't afford to pay us. Um, my student teaching, uh, you know, was experiencing something similar to that as well. So like, you know, my first two years of, of really being in a classroom, I was seeing financial detriment. Um, but I still was excited to go every day. You know, I had the kids and it got me going. So, you know, I guess to, to kind of crack the surface, uh, what you said you've left three times. Um, do you mind kind of giving us a little bit of insight to why you left three times? Sure, sure. <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, so uh, the first time I left um, the profession, um, I had already been to three different school districts trying to find that right fit. I think it's a huge um, misunderstanding that teachers will find their right fit right out the gate and that they'll stay with one or two schools um, and you find your perfect match. I truly believe it's like any long-term commitment in a relationship. You need to make sure that all the pieces that you need are fulfilled by your employer, but also that you're fitting the the need that your employer needs. And um, my first teaching job right out of the gate, I was um, a part-time family and consumer studies teacher. None of um, my background has any of that, but they loved my interview. And so they didn't want to leave, want me to leave. And they dangled the carrot in front of me that if I stayed and I taught a year um, as a part-time teacher completely out of my realm, that this following year there'd be an opening for me. Mm -hmm. And I was very upset um, when the following year came and that was not the case. Um, so I, I moved schools and um, a couple of times I moved schools. Um, one was professional, but then um, another time was personal. I just, I was driving an hour and a half to work and an hour and a half home and it was completely unfeasible. So, um, then um, I moved schools one more time and um, that was a personal reason that I left that school. But I left the profession after five years because I was very anxious. I was very, um, I was upset and I was angry that I felt like I had done everything my employers, every one of them had asked me to do and then I was told to, to decide that our schools were, our traditional school was moving into different types of schools of thought. So like an art school and a technology school and, um, and a project learning based school. And we as teachers were told we needed to pick the type of school we wanted to go to and interview there. Well, I was teaching juniors at the time. So I wanted to stay with a traditional school to make sure that my juniors had a senior teacher that they knew and that they had consistency with. And I was unrightfully thought of as not being on board with the changes. And, um, and I left because the other schools that I was with, I just didn't feel very um, supported all the time. And then this was like the last straw. Um, another time that I left the profession was um, because I was in, I was in one school for seven years and I took on a ton of responsibilities. Um, I helped with student council and I was the senior class advisor and I helped with the SAT prep and I was also the English department head um, and took on student teachers. Um, but um, that was a whole lot, I was, I was one of the only female teachers that was a 
the department head. And there was, um, for lack of a better description, a, a good old boys club, a, a club that was um, primarily men, um, but it was, you know, they all fit in together and they all joked around. And I just felt like I didn't belong. And even though I took on all these other responsibilities, um, some allegations came out with other teachers and I knew these teachers and I was indirectly involved, but I had all of these other responsibilities and it just, the expectation was too much. And I just, I had to walk away um, for my own mental health and well being. And um, the last time I left the profession um, was completely, um, I thought I was going back for good. And I knew I took a one year position, um, again, with the understanding that if I did well, there would be a job for me maybe not in that department, but in a different um, facet. And um, I helped recreate a writing curriculum and all of my observations and all of my, you know, times that my principal or my AVID coordinator would come to my classroom were glowing. And then at the end of the year, um, it was right before spring break, um, they told me that they were gonna non-renew me. And when I asked why, I was given a statement that pretty much said, because I signed a one-year contract, they can terminate the contract with no prior information. Mm -hmm. So I was very, very bitter and left for three years that time. Yeah. Every other time was just one year. <laughs> <clears throat> and I think, so I think that goes, I mean, you brought up a couple of really, really big points that I think a lot of people don't realize about our profession. Um, first and foremost, for, for people who don't know, um, like tenure and everything has kind of gone away. And now you're pretty much an like not an independent contractor per se, but uh, teaching is, it, it's a one year, it's a year by year contract. And for your, when you begin in a district, you're always on a probationary phase. And a probationary phase is like, there, there's really no guarantees in a probationary phase. Um, you know, you have your evaluations, but you know, things might change unexpectedly. And as the probationary teacher, you're kind of the first one on the chopping block. So I think a lot of people don't realize that like teachers have every year, they have to consistently prove that they are meeting the expectations of the district. Now, people might be like, well, if you're a good teacher, then, then it shouldn't be a problem. That's true. But at the same time, like you had mentioned, like education changes all the time you know there, it, it seems like there's a new buzzword like every couple of years <clears throat> you know it might be marzano it might be you know different then there's like the danielson framework for evaluation then there's randa then there's a and then there's b and then there's c so there's a lot of you know there's there's a lot of demand for teachers to really be uh always changing and and sometimes i think and i think Ms. L, you probably think the same thing like I just want to close my door and like leave the world outside and just teach my kids. And I think that's one of the big challenges that, that the, especially new teachers that come in, you know, your first year, I mean, there's so much coming at you that you have to really be willing to navigate through. You know, you don't really, depending on your experience as a student teacher and depending on the program you went into, you either have, you know, you're hitting the ground running or you're hitting the ground and you're on fire. And I think the latter is more common. <clears throat> and then- Yeah, I mean, and I think even as a good teacher, <clears throat> if, you, um, if you're not the right fit for what that school really needs, then it, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're on the chopping block because you're probationary. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and yes, I remember many, many times <clears throat> thinking, if I could just close my door and they would just let me teach. Like mm -hmm. I know how to teach, give me any curriculum. I will teach it for you. But there's all these other expectations that are on your plate. There's always a new buzzword um, or a new type of um, platform or a new type of um, methodology that they want you to incorporate into your lessons and they're good. But then the following year you have a brand new set and you're required to incorporate them. And was the other stuff bad? Is that why we got rid of it? No, it's just not new. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. And every district does that. 
everywhere mm -hmm. I've ever been, even charter schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's not, and I love how you said, like, it, it's not that things are bad, you know, but it's it's that they're not new. And I think one one flaw that we have, and one, I think a dream of most teachers, and honestly, and, and I want to, you know, take a moment and, and say, you know, we're not blaming admin, like, on the cell. Like, we all have a person that we answer to, you know, they answer to somebody, they answer to somebody. And 99.9% .9 of the time, like, they're, they're, their hearts are in the right place, but there is like this, this constant push for, for different things. And I feel like sometimes we don't have time to really prove the benefit fully of a program, whether it's, you know, ed tech that we're using, you know, using Canvas versus Schoology or, you know, using, you know, like the focus on learning targets as opposed to learning objectives. And it's, it's disheartening, you know, and then Going back with another part of what you said, <clears throat> you know, the evaluation process for teaching is is kind of a tricky beast because, again, you know, admin they they have their responsibilities, and on top of that, they also are responsible for evaluating us. And you know, we are human, and we naturally gravitate towards certain people, and we naturally go away from the other kinds of people, whether it's through you know, personalities, interests, so on and so forth, you know, like some people's personality can be really off-putting and it's not that they're a bad person, but maybe they're just really outgoing, they're kind of loud or, you know, and, and so you do run that risk of, you know, if, if you have an evaluator who doesn't really see you as part of the club, you run that risk of not being evaluated, I'm not gonna say fairly, but more effectively. And then different times of the year, you know, admin has their responsibilities. So they're not able to come into your classroom and see you. So then the benefit of proof is on you. You know, at the end of the year, we have to prove to our administration that we're doing our jobs. We're, we're meeting these set standards. So we have to bring in documentation. And I think that's another big thing that really turns a lot of people off is, is again, look at the kids, look at the progress they're making let us teach our kids the way we know how to do it and we will we'll, we'll give them the world on a silver platter they just have to bring the silverware but when there's 20 other things pulling us away from the classroom there's 20 other pds that we have to learn that could have easily been an email that takes us away from our kids you know there's there's that component of teaching that i think a lot of people aren't aware of is that being in the classroom with the kids is only a small percentage of what we do. It's the best part. It's the best part. Like, I mean, <clears throat> I've had, I've always had an open door policy in my classroom. And some of my best moments when my kids are, you know, having lunch with my kids or, you know, having just, you know, kids just popping by during their off period just to hang out. And it's the best part. But then, you know, a lot of times there's also like, well, I have to have a working lunch because we have a, you know, we have a meeting about testing today or, you know, we have to go and do, uh, you know, do another, you know, 20,000 things that take us away from our kids or away from our planning. Well, and that's another part of the um, evaluation process, too, is that, I mean, our principals or our evaluators only get into our classrooms, you know, a few times because mm -hmm. they have a lot of responsibilities. And then, so they use those evaluations or observations, and then they also use our test scores which I don't know if that's a full complete picture, not only of my students, of myself. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the burden of proof is, is on us mm -hmm. to show that we have done these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, there's no <laughs> spot in there. Um, I would love in evaluations, there is be a spot for like a parent evaluation and a student evaluation. Yeah, because yeah. I always have, students and parents tell me how grateful they are for what I've done for their kid. And truthfully, like a lot of times it's not just what I've done for their student, it's, it's that their student has risen to the occasion. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish there was that part in there, but that's not a part of the evaluation. I've never seen it. And I've been in multiple different school districts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I mean, like, you know, I think one thing that people don't understand about teaching, you know, cause I've, I've had many jobs. I've worked in a factory as a forklift operator in a freezer. Um, I served four years in the Marine Corps as an enlisted infantryman. Um, I've worked at PetSmart as a dog trainer and as a bather. I've worked at McDonald's, Domino's Pizza, Jimmy John's Target. 
And with all of those, you know, it, it's a product-based uh, society. Like most of those jobs are product-based, right? Like meeting the sales plan, uh, being able to provide customer service, not having customer complaints, but you're also working hand in hand with your evaluators. You know, when I was in the Marine Corps, you know, I had my, my squad leader saw me every day. My team leader saw me every day. So when they came down to evaluation, I was evaluated every day. When I worked at PetSmart, I worked directly with my supervisors. And there was no secret as to what I was doing for the majority of my time, which I love about teaching. I love that we do have the autonomy that we're in our own classroom and we're not being micromanaged. But at the same time, it's one of those things where a lot of people enter the teaching profession not realizing that there's a lot more burden of proof on us and that there's a lot less of one, one to one, um, you know, observation. And there's, there, I think it was like six times or, or, or nine times a year. Um, so out of a hundred. Um, honestly, I, I think, um, I think in our state we have um, for probationary teachers, you need to have um, two formal observations. And then um, I think um, three or four informal observations. Yeah. yeah. And so total that's, that's six. And then yeah. for those of you guys who don't know, a formal observation is usually 40 minutes and informal is usually um, unannounced and 20 yeah. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So when you think about a school, there's 180 days. Have. Yeah, so out of 180 days you're being seen, let, let's just say, because I don't want people to be in the comment section saying, oh, well, you actually, had, it's, it's 13 days. You have less than 15 out of your 180 days, less than 10% of your time with kids is, is actually being evaluated. Now, obviously, if you have an open door policy, that's up to you. But, but what it all comes down to, because I don't want it to sound like we're just complaining about our job. It's just more like what we think needs to be changed to help keep people in the profession. Um, you know, we definitely think that there's, uh, there, there's benefit to change, obviously, but we think that we need to change with a purpose and not change just for changing sake. Um, you know, for some of the um, coursework that I'm doing, I, I read an article and, and I will forever remember that it talked about in order to, uh, for a school to really see change happen, with a new methodology or a, a new thought process or a new you know, curriculum, you really need to have it in place for three years before you see the change. Mm -hmm. And that's, so teachers get used to it. They can work together and plan. Students can start to acclimate and then teachers can see how students are reacting and, and help parents understand the curriculum as well. And so three years for a buzzword to be in your curriculum, that doesn't happen very often, that it sticks around that long. We mm -hmm. usually have to change it before then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So it's 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 a tricky world. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's not a perfect system, but you know, it's got its its perks, it's got its ups and its downs. But uh, you know, we just we we really wanted today to share with everyone kind of some of the the background information that goes with with teaching that um, really pushes a lot of teachers out the door. Um, but <clears throat> a, a big thing though is is I don't think neither of us have said anything about the kids or parents, and I think that's a big thing for people to realize is you know kids are ninety nine percent of the reason why we do our jobs. Um, and then parents, parents can be great. You know, I've developed really good relationships with parents. I mean, there, there have been some parents that come in, you know, we all want the same thing. So, and I think that's the biggest thing that we establish and, and it works out really well. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's not a perfect system. Um, it's, it's the best job in the world, but, uh, you know, it's a hard job. And if you come into it without understanding these, these additional um, background pieces, I think it can really be detrimental to somebody who really dreams of being a teacher only to find out that like, oh my gosh, like there's all this stuff. So um, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna be looking at making uh, a part two to this so that we can kind of give some advice for, uh, for future teachers. But yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it, again, it's, it's a beautiful burden, I always say. Like being a teacher. Yeah, I mean, I would say the best part of my job is, is dealing with students. And it's, it's a complete um, misconception that students and parents are a reason that people would quit teaching. I think people would move schools or get into a different job 
in the teaching realm because maybe they were dissatisfied with the students or parents where they're at. But it's not why teachers leave. I, I don't think that. Um, and in all of my years of teaching, um, I would say, honestly, there were only two places that I personally was disenchanted um, with students themselves. And honestly, I think that was my fault. I thought I could be a middle school teacher and I'm just not cut from that cloth. I, I need to teach high school students. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Linder, for joining us today. Uh, again, be on the lookout for part two uh, in the future. Um, you know, as, as we can see, it's, it's a very uh, complex challenge for teachers that, that's uh, bringing people into the profession but sending people out. So I think down the line, we might have to get back together and do another teacher talk and uh, maybe give some advice for, for future teachers, I think. So um, but no, thank you very much for being a part of uh, today's teacher talk. And uh, yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Lindred, the, the talented and the wonderful, a uh, really good friend of mine, and uh, really, and the, and the, the dogs, of course. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you again for watching. Again, uh, my name is AJ Edwards, and this is my channel, Mr. E's Classroom. Uh, if you like what you saw, please like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and let us know in the comments, you know, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges for being a teacher that may lead someone out the door? Or if you're a teacher, what are some advice that you would have for incoming teachers to help them navigate through those first few years when they're trying to find their voice? But uh, thank you all again for watching and thank you for stopping by Mystery's Classroom. So make it a great day and we'll see you soon.